Welcome everyone. My name is Marisa Gomez and I'm the Public Programs Manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. Tonight we are going to be learning about one of my absolute favorite places in Santa Cruz County, the Bonnie Doon Ecological Reserve, as well as uh, the Santa Cruz Sandhills in general. From one of our region's greatest champions of these places, Dr. Jody McGraw, who I am joined by here now. Hi, Jody. Thanks for being here. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Um, before I hand things over to you, I do just have a few notes that I wanted to share with everyone. Um, so tonight's program is part of the series CZU and You in partnership with Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Together, we're offering a month of programs meant to support our community as we remember the events of last year's CZU Lightning Complex fires by providing resources for recovery, preparedness, and ecological understanding. And I believe this is the final online event of the series. Um, and we have recordings of all the prior online events online and a few more in-person programs that we're going to be doing this weekend. And I want to acknowledge that the fires impacted the ancestral lands of the Awaswas and Ramatush speaking Kiroste, Sayanta, Yupi, Chitoni, and Ashastaka. Today, these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsun tribal band who are working hard to fulfill their obligation to creator to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through relearning efforts in the Amamutsun Land Trust. And just once more, I want to invite you all to communicate with us throughout the presentation using the chat. If you have not already, please take a moment to adjust who you are sending your messages to and select the option for everyone uh, so that we can all communicate with each other and your um, fellow attendees can also see what it is that you have to share. And this time, why don't you share one thing you know about the Santa Cruz sand hills. Um, have you ever visited the Santa Cruz sand hills maybe? What's one thing you can find there? Anything that's surprised you about this habitat? Um, whatever comes to mind, please let us know in the chat. And I know that Jody was especially interested in reading your responses. So please take a moment to consider that. And uh, on that note, I'm going to bring Jody back in to the mix. I'll stop sharing my screen now and bring her in. So um, Jody, I'm, I'm sure you're gonna be sharing with us loads of things that you know about the Sand Hills. So I will not pose that question um, to you, but first, can you also just share with us a little bit about your background and how you're connected to this local habitat? Sure, thanks Marisa. So yeah, my name is Jody McGraw and I'm a conservation ecologist. So I um, have a small, environmental consulting firm uh, here based in Santa Cruz County and our firm works on primarily on conservation uh, projects related to endangered species and um, conservation of biodiversity uh, in the central coast of California and I specialize in the Santa Cruz Sandhills and I became really interested in adaptive endemic ecosystems uh, meaning those unique ecosystems that occur on unique soil conditions um, in as part of my undergraduate work at UC Santa Cruz. So I'm a uh, former banana slug, or I guess maybe once a banana slug, always a banana slug. Um, and I actually did uh, a, a senior thesis in the Santa Cruz Sandhills in the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve in 1993. So I'm <laughs> dating myself there. Um, and went on to do dissertation research at UC Berkeley in the Sandhills and pretty much have just been working in the sand hills on conservation and management projects ever since. So I got um, coming up on, on almost 30 years of research in the sand hills and I look forward to sharing a little bit about what I've learned over a couple decades and learning from other folks here maybe at the end, the end of the presentation. Cool, happy to, to share space with a fellow sand hills lover. All right, thanks for inviting me. I go ahead and share my screen? Yeah, please do. Okay, great. Great. <clears throat> Wonderful. Well, again, thank you again so much for having me. Um, I have a little bit of a presentation put together and again, look forward to answering questions people have. Uh, in this presentation though, I'd like to give a little bit of background about the sand hills, uh, meaning the um, information about the distribution, geology, soils, uh, communities, the flora, the fauna, and then um, really want to spend some time um, based on the theme of this presentation uh, talking about fire ecology and um, research in the sand hills. 
So first, um, what are the Santa Cruz Sandhills? So the Sandhills are unique communities of plants and animals that are found only on outcroppings of sand soil in central Santa Cruz County. Uh, so um, that is um, a really important kind of basic thing to understand. And they've been um, uh, re referred to or uh, analyzed, uh, the, I guess the renowned biologist Peter Raven re uh, referred to them as sort of similar to the Galapagos Islands, which, um, you know, those are famous archipelago everyone knows about, known for the high um, uh, abundance of endemic species. And the sand hills in Santa Cruz County are um, similar in that they're biological islands. So they occur as patches out in a matrix of otherwise um, mixed evergreen and redwood forest. And like the Galapagos, in some respects, the sand hills have an inordinate number of endemic species, species that are found in the sand hills, but nowhere else um, in the world. So where are the sand hills? The sand hills are uh, located in central Santa Cruz County, uh, primarily between uh, the Highway 17 and Bonnie Dune, so Scotts Valley, Bonnie Dune, and up north towards Boulder Creek, with the highest concentration of habitat being around uh, Scotts Valley, Felton, and Ben Lomond. And there was about 7,000 acres of habitat originally. Um, in the sand hills, we think, we estimate. And if you've heard about other sand hills um, habitat in the United States, Nebraska, for example, Georgia, um, a lot of the sand hills in the southeast of the United States, uh, that's because those are referring to other unique adaptive endemic ecosystems on sandy soils in those areas. Um, but they're ecologically uh, maybe similar in some respects, including their fire ecology, but they're not the same uh, communities of plants and animals. So a little bit about the geology in the sand hills. The sand hills um, occur on the Santa Margarita Formation, which is a, a, a marine sediment sandstone that was formed um, about 15 million years ago when the area was underneath a vast ocean. And the reason we know that is the um, sand hills, um, Santa Margarita Formation features many fossils, marine fossils. So a lot of times people uh, think that the sand hills are dunes or ancient dunes like we have at Fort Ord, which um, those are ancient dunes, but the sand hills are actually the bottom of the seafloor. Another way we know that the bottom of the seafloor is the finding um, fossils like the manatee, the sandhill sea, sea cow. Um, this uh, was found in the 1960s in a sandhills quarry during quarry operations. And the sea cow, which is a, again, an extinct relative of the present day manatee, uh, was curated by um, the museum's own Frank Perry, who created the cast shown here in the upper right hand corner uh, that hangs over the, um, in the bookshop, uh, used to be, it was, it still is in the bookshop if you go into the museum. Uh, talk a little bit about the soils. The Santa Margarita Formation gives rise to the Zianti sand soil. Um, the Zianti sand soil is the name of the sandy soil that occurs in the sand hills. It's a coarse sand soil uh, comprised of about 90 to 95 percent sand particles. So it really is like being at the beach if you haven't been to the sand hills. Um, the soil is very poorly developed, uh, has low organic matter and therefore low nutrient availability and also very low moisture holding capacity. So when compared with the loam soil, um, it's a very droughty, low nutrient soil. So the soil interacts with our climate to influence the sand hills communities. So the region that the sand hills are located in typically has a moist maritime climate with about anywhere from 40 to 60 degrees of precipitation, uh, inches, excuse me, of precipitation per year in a good year or in a normal year. Of course, this year not being one of those years, uh, but normally that, that high level of rainfall and the fog all combine to give rise to music vegetation like coast redwood forest, McEver mixed evergreen forest, and other uh, for dense forests. But on the adjacent outcrops of sandhill soils, you use any soils, you get these very strikingly different endemic plant communities. The sandhills communities are typified um, by this in this picture here. They're known locally by many people as sand parkland and sand chaparral or sand, cha sand hill chaparral. Sand Parkland is off in the distance on this ridge, which is South Ridge, a very iconic Sand Hills Ridge, and the Sand Chaparral is in the foreground. 
expand chaparral um, is characterized by dense, relatively dense cover of shrubs and also emergent trees like oaks and the ponderosa pines. And in between the gaps or the, in between the canopies of the trees and shrubs, you get these nice canopy gaps uh, that have herbaceous plant species that are oftentimes very diverse and very important ecologically, uh, like this Ben Lomond spine flower. The sand parkland community is very different uh, from the sand chaparral. It has very few woody shrubs, though there are some, and instead is characterized by a sparse canopy of ponderosa pine trees, usually like 20 to 40 percent canopy, and then herbaceous plants, again, are wildflowers um, in the um, understory and around uh, between the trees. The flora or plant species of the sandhills is very diverse and unique uh, for the region. And it includes uh, four species that are endemic to the sandhills. Again, those are species that are found in the sandhills, but nowhere else in the world. Uh, these include silverleaf manzanita, also known as bonnie dune manzanita, which is a large evergreen shrub in the uh, Aracaceae or Heath family. And manzanita, as many of you may know, is um, uh, Spanish for little apple. They have little apple-shaped fruits. Um, and then the silver leaf, manzanita, refers to the silvery leaf pubescence, uh, which helps the, the shrub adapt to the very hot, dry conditions in the sand hills by reflecting back excess sunlight. The silverleaf manzanita flowers between uh, about late November and uh, January when you can find these wonderful urn-shaped flowers. Ben Lomond spine flower is an annual plant in the buckwheat family, or Polygonaceae, and it is a, um, contrasting with the silverleaf manzanita. It's a very low-growing annual plant. The spine flower refers to the spiny involucres or bracts that are around the flower that help uh, greatly facilitate dispersal of the seeds of the Ben Lomond spine flower. Ben Lomond buckwheat is a, a perennial plant, a uh, perennial herb in the buckwheat family. Uh, and it's, it's kind of cool. You go out uh, to Bonnie Dune or some other sand hill sites this time of year. It's uh, one of just a few plants that you can actually find still in flower. Flowers really late in the season, July, August, September. Um, one of the other endemics is the Santa Cruz wallflower, Aristomum tritifolium, and the Brassicaceae, or mustard family. This is a short-lived, or biennial to short-lived perennial herb. Um, wallflower, I guess, refers to the tall um, stature of plants when they don't get browsed by deer anyway. Um, and the yellow flowers of the wallflower are frequented by the chalcedon checker spot butterfly, which is an um, abundant and important pollinator for this and other plants in the sandhills. Um, Santa Cruz cypress is not a true sandhills endemic. In fact, it's, an, it's found in oligotrophic soils or nutrient, other nutrient poor, poor soils on the western slope of the Santa Cruz mountains. Um, but it uh, occurs in the sandhills, and I'll be talking about it in the context of the fire ecology and uh, the um, a CZU fire in particular today. Uh, but the, this map shows the locations of the Santa Cruz cypress, uh, which is again endemic to the western slope of the Santa Cruz mountains, um, just from a handful of five populations uh, uh, worldwide. And these species um, are amongst other, um, uh, amongst the just the, the known species that have been described by taxonomists. There's other plants um, that have been discussed and maybe are unique. Maybe uh, they're on the evolutionary trajectory into becoming unique. Uh, one of those is this, the ponderosa pine itself. Ponderosa pines and the sandhills have unique morphological characteristics and have been described by some as a unique species. Um, currently, um, uh, the taxonomy is always changing on these things, but that, that's one of the species that um, is definitely um, on the continuum of becoming unique, perhaps in the sandhills. California poppy is a messy uh, taxonomic uh, species altogether, and the sandhills are fun. They have these um, plants with very, very colorful foliage, so instead of being green, um, they have blue and purple and all sorts of other colors in their foliage. And instead of having larger orange flowers, perhaps they have the typical the common uh, small yellow flowers. There's uh, tipless tidy tips, which is a, a plant that normally has uh, white um, flowers on the tips and the sandhill form is all yellow. 
And just one more, this is the um, Sand Hills Everlasting, um, which is um, a plant species that um, doesn't uh, key out to any um, species currently as undescribed. So those are just some of the unique um, other plants in the Sand Hills uh, that could also be um, uh, unique if more, with more taxonomic research. So the, when you have unique vegetation and soils and plants, you're going to have unique fauna. Tell you a little bit about some of the animals in the sand hills. Um, the Mount Hermon June beetle is a uh, fossorial creature that lives underground most of the year um, as a larva uh, feeding on plant roots, including roots of uh, things like uh, ferns and grasses and uh, monkey flowers and uh, also their mycorrhizae, the, the fungi that live on the roots. And then the males of the species, they um, uh, out between May and August fly around looking for mates. And um, you can see this is a male and a female mating there. Um, the Bazani bandwinged grasshopper is endemic to the, and the Mount Hermon June beetle is endemic to the sandhills. The Zanny bandwinged grasshopper is another endemic insect found only in the sandhills, and it occurs only in the sand parkland habitat, where it's very well camouflaged. This little gray, um, and various shades of gray and black um, insect is about an inch long, and, and honestly, if they didn't fly, you wouldn't probably see them most of the time. And then the Santa Cruz kangaroo rat uh, uh, is historically known from various sandy soils, maritime chaparral uh, communities in the Santa Cruz mountains, um, but, uh, including the sand hills. So it's not endemic to the sand hills. Um, this species uh, is nocturnal and hops around on its large hind legs and forages in the sand chaparral gaps for seeds um, at night. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the context of fire ecology. Some of the other unique species in the sand hills include the coast horn lizard, not again endemic, but um, within Santa Cruz County, this species is found in really sandy, gravelly soils in the sand hills as well as up on summit um, on the ridgeline. Western whibtail lizard is another sand hill species, um, species that's found um, in, Santa, in the sand hills but not elsewhere in Santa Cruz County. And the Coast Mountain King Snake is um, pretty abundant for its um, for this species occurs in the sand hills. And finally, the Santa Cruz Rain Beetle, um, which is um, a really great uh, beetle that comes out during the um, flies around during the first rain of the year. So if you're ever near the sand hills um, when the first rains come in typically October, um, head out there and you can find these guys flying around um, at that time. And then the sandhills used to have other unique species like the greater roadrunner. Uh, so unfortunately, the last roadrunners in the sandhills were seen in, in the, about the mid 60s, um, probably um, succumbed to pressure from residential and other developments, which um, make it hard for a ground nesting bird to persist. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the, that was a little bit about the natural history, talk a little bit about the threats and stressors to the Sand Hills habitat. I mentioned there's about 7,000 acres of Sand Hills habitat um, originally, um, and um, a lot of that habitat has unfortunately been lost, converted to other uses. Sand mining is probably one of the biggest factors involved in that. Uh, the Sand Hills have uh, five or so quarries um, that um, were used to use, um, to obtain sand for making glass and other products, um, residential development, some commercial development as well. Uh, the, the Ben Loman transfer station or the dump is in the sand hills. And then there's also a little bit of agriculture like vineyards. Uh, so the sand hills habitat, these, um, this, this aerial image um, showing the sand hills habitat atop Graham Hill Road. If you um, know where the Juvenile Hall is or the Henry Cowell Extension properties are, um, this is that region in the um, uh, early 1940s. All that light colored, um, light gray and white is sand hills habitat. And then the same area in 2002, you can see uh, the quarrying and uh, residential development have uh, taken their toll and a lot, have removed a lot of that habitat. Although we're very fortunate that some areas like Sand Hill, the Henry Cowell extension uh, persisted and been protected. Um, when you, uh, obviously when you convert habitat, you fragment much of what is left. So a lot of the 
sand hills were already biological islands and, and separated um, patches by streams. Like um, on the left showing, uh, this is an area where Bean Creek flows through the sand hills. So you would have riparian habitat kind of uh, another vegetation breaking up the sand hills habitat. But with um, habitat uh, loss and conversion, the remaining patches have become much smaller. Um, as a result of these and other factors, uh, uh, four of the uh, endemic species have been listed as federally endangered. Uh, the Ben Lomond spine flower and the Santa Cruz or Ben Lomond wallflower were both listed as federally endangered in 1994. And then the Zianti bandwinged grasshopper and the uh, Mount Hermon June beetle were listed in 1997. Um, this is, slide shows uh, some other um, species with special status, including the Santa Cruz cypress, which is um, both state and federally listed as um, in, are threatened now, um, federally listed, but also state endangered. The wallflower is state endangered, uh, Ben Lomond buckwheat and the silverleaf manzanita are California rare plant rank in um, 1B plants, which are endangered. And the um, coast horn lizard is a species of special concern. And these species, particularly the endangered species, help provide uh, protection, um, regulatory protection, and uh, for a lot of the other statusless species in the sandhills, including many of those um, species that have not yet been described. Uh, in the early 2000s, as I was finishing up my dissertation, I had the opportunity to help to develop um, a document called the Sandhills Conservation Management Plan, working with other Sandhills researchers and consultants and experts uh, to synthesize existing research about the Sandhills, um, prioritize land for protection, recommend habitat management, uh, help you know de develop restoration and reclamation guidelines, um, and provide even information about um, outreach and education, as well as uh, suggestions for future research. And and in the ensuing, oh gosh, I guess we're going on 17 years or so, uh, there has been a lot of uh, great effort, including by the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County to protect additional sand hills habitat. The Land Trust has a Save the Sand Hills campaign um, and works a lot with the museum as well uh, to protect and provide education opportunities in the sand hills. They protected seven, um, actually this is out of date now, eight properties totaling um, 622 acres with a very recent acquisition this December um, from working off the priorities that were identified in the Sand Hill Conservation Management Plan. Um, so um, even though there's a fair amount of protected land, the species in them are, are not necessarily safe from uh, population extirpations and declines. Um, that the habitat degradation can take its toll even within our protected lands. There's three of the primary threats um, to species and, and communities in, the, in protected lands are fire exclusion, exotic plants, and incompatible recreation use. Uh, these things can all um, take their toll as well. Um, the sand hills, unfortunately, have been invaded by uh, things like acacias, like silver wattle, uh, jubata grass, and exotic brooms, French broom, Portuguese broom, um, can get patchily abundant in the sand hills. Um, and you would think that they would be maybe resistant, the sand hills, to such biological invasions. But unfortunately, um, there are some species from the Mediterranean region in particular, those shrubs and trees that I mentioned, plus a whole host of Mediterranean um, grasses and forbs, European grasses and forbs, that are able to um, establish, pre, sort of pre-adapted to the sandy soils, the low nutrient soils, and able to invade the sand hills. Um, as illustrated here, the, the brown uh, grass and stuff is, is typically non-native um, uh, plant cover in the sand hills and outcompetes native plants. Um, as illustrated in this um, plot, where exotic plants are experimentally removed, you get a uh, great cover of some of the native species like the wallflower and the spine flower on the right. And when the exotic plants are left intact, unfortunately, the abundance of the endangered species is much lower. Um, a related important management issue at the large spatial scale and one that's obviously most relevant to this um, talk series is uh, fire ecology and fire management. So I'll spend the rest of the evening talking about those topics. 
So Sandhills Fire Ecology, um, I would say it falls under the still poorly understood being explored category like a lot of systems in, in California. Um, we know that many plant species in the sandhills are adapted to fire. They have adaptations um, that are specific to establishing falling fire, like silverleaf manzanita, uh, which is an obligate seeding species, meaning um, seeds germinate, uh, seedlings establish following fire as opposed to uh, resprouting from burls or other um, structures. Um, Ponderosa pine, the other dominant species in the sandhills, is shade intolerant. As a tree, it won't establish, seedlings can't uh, handle uh, too much shade, um, so it uh, is also adapted to establishing after a fire, which clears established canopy. Uh, endangered species in the sandhills often require some aspect of fire to persist, um, including open canopy conditions and bare mineral soil. Um, and I'll go over some of those examples as we as we proceed with the talk. Uh, and you know the specifics of the, the quote unquote natural fire regime of the Sandhills again are poorly understood. So we don't have a ton of information about the fire return interval, the fire type or severity. Um, this information un unfortunately uh, isn't fully available, um, and so it makes managing fire um, a, a little bit challenging. But we do know that um, in the absence of fire, we see a lot of changes in the structure and as well as the species composition of the vegetation as indicated in these historical and more recent aerial photographs. Um, so this is Bonnie's two Sand Hills Chaparral sites that are very important for um, this large community, an important community uh, occur in Bonnie Dune, the ecological reserve. This is Martin Road shown here and Henry Cowell, that's Graham Hill Road. And you can see that um, between 1940, um, when Bonnie Dune had actually fairly recently burned um, in 1997, that the amount of open habitat uh, or white soil is greatly reduced over that time period. And that is a result of, of course, succession, growth of the shrubs and trees. Um, and you know, pr prior to the Martin fire in the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve, this is uh, what it used to look like. There was basically these small trails and just very few limited canopy gaps associated with soil disturbance. And it was otherwise very dense uh, cover of silverleaf manzanita um, and other shrubs and trees. Um, and again, very few um, canopy gaps where things like Ben Lomond's fine flower, uh, the endangered fine flower, um, and other native plants need to persist. Uh, and Caitlin Bean, a researcher who uh, studied the Santa Cruz kangaroo rat um, in the early aughts, uh, uh, did some research to try to uh, locate the species um, at four sandhill sites where it had previously been documented in the early 80s. And unfortunately, she was only able to um, identify uh, the species at Henry Cowell, the Henry Cowell extension. Uh, off Graham Hill Road, and for for oh gosh, the better part of 20 years, um, this part this species, or the species was thought to only occur in this one single location in the entire world. Fortunately, um, a camera trap researcher recently found um, Santa Cruz kangaroo rat up on top of Summit in the Sierra Azul region, which is very exciting in the last couple of years. Uh, so that's good news. But the populations at the Olympia Well Field, Gray Whale Ranch, and Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve. Um, are all presumed to be extirpated, or at least um, the, the Santa Cruz kangaroo rat is, um, population is below detectable levels. Um, it has not been detected with multiple trapping events. Um, so we have this kind of background history of fire, fire exclusion. Obviously, fire is excluded from the landscape because of the homes and lives and, and property and, and other things that we value in the landscape. Um, but in 2008, June 2008, the Martin Fire um, uh, was ignited in Bonnie Dune and uh, burned the uh, portion of the ecological reserve. Um, so it burned for about five days, and there was about 460 acres in that fire, and um, about 324 acres of which was in the ecological reserve um, that's managed by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and that burn area included silverleaf manzanita, uh, Santa Cruz kangaroo rat habitat, uh, areas uh, occupied by Mount Hermon June beetle, um, uh, came close to the wallflower habitat, I believe, 
and also unburned portions of the Santa Cruz cypress, um, that population that occurs in Bonnie Dune, which is here. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the Santa Cruz cypress forest, and then we'll discuss uh, fire ecology for the Santa Cruz wallflower, or Ben Loman wallflower. <laughs> So Santa Cruz Cypress, um, again, is an, uh, endemic to the western slope of the Santa Cruz Mountains. It's not found only in the sand hills, but it does occur in the sand hills. And it's a closed cone conifer. So it has these serotonous cones uh, that are adapted to opening up following fire or may maybe mechanical damage or something else um, that causes um, tissue damage and death of the stem. And that causes the seeds in the cone, the cone to open up and the seeds to be released. Um, the seeds obviously fall on the ground, and if they're after a fire, you have nice bare mineral soil, and you get these um, little seedlings, which grow up over about um, 11 years. It's been estimated, I think, uh, maybe there's probably a range on that, until the juvenile uh, trees will actually become reproductive and produce um, cones and seeds and mature, and the cycle starts again. And, and we don't know exactly how long they can live, but um, several of the populations have been living um, um, for several uh, for unburned areas for, for decades. So um, they do get senescent, but it's probably so, um, on the order of uh, 80 to 100 years or more. Uh, in 2010 uh, era, um, there was a portion of the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve that did not burn, had um, what was deemed uh, to be a senescent stand of Santa Cruz Cypress that um, was um, concerned, there was concern about it posing a risk of fire, both you know moving from the adjacent residential area into the reserve or maybe from the reserve into the residential area. Um, and so a project was conducted um, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to um, conduct like a fuel reduction in this. And the, the, the treatments included um, removing French broom, removing dead trees, including Santa Cruz cypress, removing live trees, except not any Santa Cruz cypress. So no live cypress trees were removed, just oaks and Douglas fir, and then limbing up trees to reduce ladder fuel. So, this was a, a project done after the fire and again in the area nearby um, where the, the just hadn't burned. And so in 2011, um, I received a, a grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to study the effects of the Martin fire on the Santa Cruz Cypress. And uh, we set up that study to um, kind of use the, that, the fire as well as the manual treatment as a sort of an experiment to look at how, how fire compares to um, mechanical or manual removal of fuels as method to establish Cypress. And we did that by establishing replicate five meter by five meter plots in areas that burned, areas where the fuel reduction occurred, and areas that had no treatment or control area. Just a little bit of data for the evening. Um, the, what we found is that the fire reduced the cover and depths of litter. That's the, the leaf litter, the sticks, the twigs, the, um, the needles, as it were, um, scales of the, the cypress and other species that are on the ground. Um, and in all these graphs, by the way, the red are uh, the burned plots, the green is the manual clearing, and the gray is the control. So you can see that the litter is much lower in the, uh, both in terms of depth and cover in the burn. It burned off all that litter, and it also reduced the canopy by killing, top killing the cypress trees and other trees. Um, but when you compare that to the manual clearing project, um, it did not remove the litter, and it did not reduce the canopy. So there was no sort of similar effect to fire. And then um, turning then to the Santa Cruz Cypress, we found that the fire increased cypress seedling and juvenile density. So we had multiple years of cohorts, meaning the seedlings established in multiple years following the fire in the burn area. Um, but we just had like a handful of seedlings in one of the manual clearing plots. So the manual removal did not simulate the beneficial effects of fire in terms of promoting establishment of the trees. Um, we also found that for other native species that the fire increased the cover as well as the richness of native species, and this was primary, or species overall, but this was primarily driven by native plants. So you had more native plants, um, other fire um, responsive species 
um, uh, establishing in the burn area. And this was not um, observed in the manual cleared area. And that's likely due to the lack of removal of the canopy and the litter, which are key things to pressing native plants. So this is kind of a picture that shows what that looks like. This is the area right after the fire during the summer and uh, the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve, you know, a few years later, it was very diverse and floriferous with species like bush poppy and silverleaf manzanita establishing from seed and, um, you know, all sorts of uh, fire followers. Uh, ben Lomond's fine flower uh, proliferated post-fire that was really, um, really beneficial in terms of um, the regrowth following the 2008 Martin fire. Um, I thought, saw this one on the uh, website for this talk, so I thought I would say yes. So the clustered broom rape really so does seem to do well post fire in the sand hills as well. So this brings us now here we are, 13 years later, um, and of course in oops, in um, 20, 2020, so last August, we had the CZU Lightning Complex fire, and that fire, as as I'm sure many of you know burned over 86,000 acres in the western slope of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, that fire perimeter included uh, four of the five Santa Cruz Cypress populations. So basically all of the Cypress burned except for a little part of the Majors Creek population, the southern stand, um, and the Bonnie Dune um, stand also uh, was largely unburned by that fire. Um, but the, all the Butino population, Eagle Rock, Rack and Bray, um, look to be completely burned. Um, so this presents obviously a really important uh, opportunity to evaluate the effects of this large um, fire on this fire adapted species. And um, we have a plan and a recently, recently announced um, to be a grant to fund the work, which is very exciting to take a look at the effects of the CZU lightning fire on Santa Cruz Cypress uh, over the next three years. Um, we're gonna be looking at how um, fire effect, you know, the fire affected the distribution or aerial extent, sort of remap all the stands, look at the demography, seedling establishment, um, adult mortality and survivorship, uh, and also importantly, habitat conditions, because um, these stands uh, were not only affected by the fire, uh, but some of them may also have been affected by fire suppression efforts, um, cutting of trees, um, a bulldozer lines, fire lines, et cetera. Um, kind of one of the key questions uh, I'm interested in exploring is how the drought of this year following the fire may influence um, the ceiling establishment and therefore uh, determine whether this fire is going to be um, re regenerative ultimately in terms of replacing the stands or if unfortunately drought might interact with a fire to cause the um, population to decline if we don't get good recruitment. We're also going to be um, recensusing the, the fire plots at the Martin Road, uh, Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve. Um, uh, so about 14 years post fire, we'll be able to go back to those and we have the data from them from 2011 that said how many seedlings and juveniles were there. We can recensus those and see what their survivorship is and the extent to which those um, stands are going to persist. Look, look at things like habitat conditions, including exotic plants as well. And then we're going to map the Santa Cruz Cypress population, which has actually never been mapped on the ground, only um, based on um, coarse aerial imagery. Okay, so now I'll turn to the, the Ben Lomond, or also known as Santa Cruz Wallflower. I'll try to call it one, Ben Lomond Wallflower. Um, this is um, a, a species that had about 17 uh, populations that were mapped or identified in the 1970s, of which five have um, been extirpated, so meaning, meaning have gone extinct, at least above ground. And, um, oops. The Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve um, uh, features a pop two above ground populations or occurrences. Um, in the early 90s, when I was working there and doing my senior thesis, um, there were two. Um, now there's just one down by Reggiardo Creek um, that is a, you know, less than uh, 20 adult plants in every year. So it's really a very small population. And recent research by Justin Whittle and his lab at Santa Clara University has documented that the species um, 
you know, self incompatible, um, and so uh, close or uh, loosely self incompatible. So close, closely related individuals, when they mate, um, they don't produce enough seed. Um, so we have a situation where that population is um, on threat on the cusp of um, also becoming extirpated. So in um, 2018, between 2018 and 2020, I teamed with uh, Dr. Whittle and um, worked with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife on a Ben Lomond wallflower reintroduction, experimental reintroduction project at the Ecological Reserve. Our goals were to expand the wallflower population, prevent it from um, going becoming extirpated at the reserve, um, to test habitat enhancement treatments so what are ways that we can uh, get this population back on a persisting or upward um, trend and um, also look at genetic treatments um, to address potential inbreeding depression due to the um, low population size and the self-incompatibility. Uh, I'll talk just primarily about the first two goals tonight. Um, we basically had eight um, sites within the um, ecological reserve Oh, and I should mention that um, after the 2008 fire, there was some hope that wallflower would um, naturally <laughs> regenerate um, from a seed bank, perhaps. Um, that did not occur. So the Martin fire did not result in any um, establishment of wallflower post-fire. Uh, so the introduction obviously was designed to take advantage of the fact that the um, Martin fire um, and, uh, created maybe opportunities um, that to reestablish the the species, but um, that where it wasn't able to establish after the fire. So we found eight locations uh, within the ecological reserve, four in the San Chaparral community and four in the San Parkland. These are all shown on the map um, that had a relatively open habitat kind of post fire, although they were becoming a little more uh, successional and denser. And we set up a small scale experiment with replicate treatment plots that were two meters by two meters each uh, to test, um, among other things, these genetic treatments, but also um, some habitat treatments. So the San Chaparral, um, some images showing the San Chaparral and the San Parkland habitat, just so you can get a feel for their similarities and differences. Um, all of the plots uh, were raked to remove the established above ground thatch and grass and any kind of um, herbaceous material um, since wallflower establishes in, in really open sandy conditions. Um, but then half of the plots received what we call the till treatment where we took shovels. It's very um, labor intensive. So we have a lot of uh, interns and um, community volunteers and others helping out. Um, we basically turned over the soil using shovels uh, to loosen the soil. This is based on other prior research that found uh, that we conducted that found that this wallflower just preferentially establishes and does well in really loose soil. Um, we broadcast seeded wallflower about almost a thousand seeds into each of the plots and then we also transplanted around the seeded area um, wallflower seedlings that were grown in a greenhouse and these were comprised of those various genetic treatments that um, I mentioned we'll, but won't be talking about today. Uh, we monitored the plots. We had two sets of plots established in two consecutive years and we monitored them over the course of um, two years uh, and looked at, uh, marked each seedling wallflower with a toothpick and counted each one with flags and um, looked at obviously their reproduction as well as um, density and establishment and survivorship. And so what did we find? We found that the tilling relative to just raking alone was, uh, was hugely beneficial for um, wallflower, increasing wallflower survivorship, which is the first graph. Um, the proportion of plants that flower, uh, survive to flower, and then uh, increasing actual individual plant flower production. Um, in fact, in the second year, um, only till plants actually reproduced and set seed successfully. So the loosening of the soil um, is hugely beneficial. And we studied various uh, soil um, conditions, soil nutrients, soil moisture, soil um, depth. Um, and, and it really was hard to pinpoint. And we're still a little, a lot of head scratching going on about the mechanism because there's not a clear link between what the soil, the soil tilling does and what how it benefits wallflower. I um, uh, would really welcome any suggestions people have to further explore this. But we, we looked and there was no clear signature for soil nutrients or soil moisture actually um, tended to be lower. 
Um, so yeah, tilling did loosen the soil and it also reduced the exotic plants more than just raking alone. So that's part of the, maybe the mechanism um, that by, by which it helps wallflowers. Um, and then it also promoted Ben Lomond's flame flower, the annual endangered plant, which co-occurs with wallflower at the ecological reserve. So that was good. Um, and um, other native plants as well. Um, and you know, we got them established in both the San Parkland and the San Chaparral. And you know, one incidental thing we did notice is that in the adjacent to shrubs, there was a fair amount of herbivory. So um, shrubs um, maybe harbor small mammals um, and other um, animals that would chew on uh, the wallflowers. And that seemed to be a factor to consider in full scale introductions. So um, just wanted to mention that this work kind of followed up on my own dissertation research that had previously looked at the effects of fire. So we'd already sort of evaluated fire as a, as a treatment for wallflower. And fire does um, promote um, germination, survivorship, and reproduction of wallflower. I did my fire um, testing for my prior research in these burn boxes, which allow you to safely contain the fire and still conduct it during the, the fire season. So this brings us to the CZU fire at the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve. As, as many of you know, if you've been out there, um, it, it burned um, probably about the, roughly the same area that burned in the Martin fire, maybe a little bit less this year, um, kind of on the eastern slope. I'll show a map shortly. Um, but we have areas that um, definitely burned, burned the silverleaf manzanita chaparral regrowth, um, again, which was just um, 12 years after the previous burn. Um, and we have areas um, where there was actually a um, fair amount of um, soil disturbance created by um, bulldozers or other heavy equipment that um, local residents drove through the ecological reserve in an attempt to create a fuel break along Martin Road and in other areas to try to uh, prevent the fire from spreading. Um, so. Uh, this map shows the fire um, location, again, coming out of Laguna Creek on the eastern side of the reserve, and also the location of the fuel breaks, which um, I think total almost um, a mile in, in distance and are about 12 to 15 feet wide, depending. Um, so with the new grant that we uh, were just awarded, we're going to be looking at how to um, kind of leverage what we've learned so far with the prior studies and see if we can um, further expand the distribution and abundance of wallflower in the ecological reserve and learn more about um, the ecology of this endangered plant um, by using the fire as sort of a natural experiment. Um, so we're gonna um, seed plots that are located um, in the burn area and also the adjacent uh, soil disturbance area, those fuel breaks. Um, we had actually long contemplated when we got the results of the tilling treatment, like well, how are we gonna actually scale that treatment up? Are we gonna bring bulldozers into the ecological reserve? Like how, how popular would that be? And yet here, um, here that actual that activity happened for us, so to speak, um, right after we wrapped up our study this uh, last year. Uh, so we want to use the opportunity created by that to test if this could actually be an effective treatment. Um, so our goal is to further expand wallflower and also learn more about it with that study. So with that, I would definitely want to leave time for questions. I want to thank, obviously, everyone involved in all the research and conservation work over the years, including the, the wallflower study, um, this crew that helped us create these plots. And I would be happy to answer any questions people have. Thank you so much, Jody. I, so many of my questions that I've been having um, in recent months with all of my walks through the reserve have now been answered. Um, and I have many more <laughs> uh, to ask of you. We also have some questions that came through the chat. Um, one based on what you were just talking about. and I. Personally, I'm so interested in the idea that you can use those dozer lines in your research. That's um, really, really great to hear. Um, Clint is wondering if the fuel and fire breaks did stop the spread of fire in the sand hills and at Bonnie Dune. Do you know if those were effective? Um, I, d I don't, I wouldn't want to say for sure. I mean, it certainly looks like it. if I go back to the map <laughs> anecdotally, like this one, but I, I honestly, like this one on next to Martin road, I obviously had no role. It was right next to the road, although a little bit offset. 
I'm not sure if this did play a role in that or not. It would probably be great to ask Cal Fire or maybe folks who are out there if there's more for a more definitive answer to that. I do not I, know. I can say based on my own experiences that I noticed that at least in the, the parts of the dozer line that you can see from the trails that are opened, the fire didn't hit it. Um, like it didn't make it that far, but there are parts where you're walking on the trail and you can see that the fire didn't didn't hop the trail, but then there are other parts yeah. that it did. So just yeah, anecdotally, I think some did and some didn't. <laughs> there's hand lines out there too, right? So the trails yeah. were used as a location to do some some hand lines. And that yeah. I think those were, this is exactly, this, this photo is designed to show like the fire burned right up to here and then basically stopped and didn't go further away. Right, so, right, yep. yeah. That, that's, yeah, it's been really interesting to, to notice that at the reserve. Um, another question from Chuck. We've seen Santa Cruz cypress propagating in Bonnie Dune in areas where there has been no fire. Is it because of unseasonably hot weather, global warming? I know you mentioned that there can be other triggers that cause the cones to open. Um, yeah, I would be curious how um, what what they're seeing and learn learn more about what and where. But definitely, there is it's a closed cone conifer. But yeah, if they get um, if there's mechanical damage to the um, the tree, the cones open, and it, it just has to hit that bare the bare mineral soil or near bare mineral soil is probably really key also. So if there's some sort of other disturbance going on, I think you can definitely uh, expect to see cypress. Probably nothing like the density we saw right. with the Martin fire, where we had over uh, thousands of seedlings and 25 meter square plots but um but yeah you definitely can get um some some background level of of establishment um due to other disturbances and yep okay cool um julia's wondering can you explain more about examples of incompatible recreation use i think this was when you were speaking about the threats to the sandhills habitats yeah, yeah, I took those slides out just for the interest of time for this talk, but, um, you know, the sand hills, uh, basically the issues are, it's very sandy soil, it doesn't hold up to a lot of perturbation, like basically very intense um, activities, so off-highway off vehicles, um, you know, anything that's on steep slopes uh, tends to just um, cause erosion, channel um, um, channel water at some point. Um, I have all sorts of pictures that show just, you know, just, it just basically, the, the, anything that's intense or frequent uh, will just displace the plants and then that exposes the soil. And if it's a slope, you just get a lot of runoff. And then if it's too frequent, it, the plants can't reestablish. So, so some recreation we do know is actually very, very compatible with the sand hills and this fact is essential to maintaining grasshopper habitat and, um, the, and wallflower habitat, but it's the sort of the, the Goldilocks sort of, you know, not, not too frequent, not too intense that, that, that we find is better. Um, and then the, obviously the more intense, more frequent, it just tends to denude everything. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Lucy is wondering, uh, she says there was an approved permit application to destroy the Brackenbrae population of Abrams Cypress. Do you know what the status of this project is? I don't know anything about that project. Um, maybe if Lucy wants to contact me offline and let me know a little bit more, I'm happy to to learn more. Obviously, I've, I've never heard any, haven't heard anything about that. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. And if anyone joining us in the chat knows more, feel free to to chime in in the chat. Um, Kara asks, "How can I help get a currently unprotected parkland area protected?" I'm thinking of the area at the top of Mount Hermon, which has a special area with spine flower and Ben Loman buckwheat. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's not your habitat. <laughs> it might be a matter of talking with a landowner and finding out what the long-term plans are for it and just making sure if it is a special and important site, making sure that they know that there's um, various programs, grant programs, um, funding available for habitat protection, including, like I said, the land trust say the Sand Hill campaign, um, making sure they know that there's easements and, you know, tax, tax benefits for, for dedicating easements. And there are all, all sorts of mechanisms to help protect habitat. So I guess I would start with, um, you know, feel free to contact me off, offline too, if you'd like to, to chat more about that. Okay. Yeah. It looks like Cara's concerned about Portuguese broom up there that needs to be removed too. So uh. <laughs> yeah, the port, the broom that that could be a whole other talk. <laughs> so there's a lot of efforts underway to just Portuguese broom and um, 
French Broom and the Southern of the Valley Sandhills, where unfortunately um, those are wreaking havoc for sure. I was I was also very interested in what you shared about invasive species um, being able to persist in a habitat that like the reason why we're talking about it is because it's so hard for <laughs> for right. plants to grow there. So that that is interesting, though, that there are some that find a way. Um, yeah. Dana is asking, is it helpful to plant some of the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve natives in surrounding properties? If so, where are the seeds or seedlings available? Um, you know, it, it can be. One, one thing that I, I think, for to answer the question, you can, there's some plants are available um, from like Central Coast Wilds as probably the primary nursery that comes to mind that um, has Sandhills um, plants available. The one other thing that um, didn't make this talk is the issue of genetic erosion. It's probably not the number one threat to sandhills, but it is something to be cognizant of is that, you know, these these patches, if you look at the map, or there are all these islands, right? And if you think about the Galapagos Islands as a little bit of a, of a metaphor, a, a similar ecological system, these these islands we found have um, been isolated for, for potentially millions of years, and they do have potential for genetic variation. We see genetic variation, for example, in the, in the Ben Lowen wallflower um, from the studies that have been done by Dr. Whittle amongst these populations. So, so I guess I'm always tend to be reluctant to, to suggest planting things a lot if they're not from the sort of same site. So you'll see that in the Santa Cruz, and that can be logistically challenging. So if you can collect seed, if you're able to, if it's a species for which you can collect legally and you have access to private land and can grow it and put it back on the same site, that's, that's the best scenario. Um, maybe contract growing um, things it would be great too, but at the same time, I, I'm a realist and I know that people have been moving stuff around these populations for probably a long time and, and we're, you know, in the Anthropocene, so maybe it's not realistic to always <laughs> hope that everything can stay put, but there are these <laughs> genetic differences and we don't want to cause genetic erosion and, and things like that. So, yeah. Whereas with the, the Santa Cruz or the Ben Lomond wallflower, um, we do want <laughs> maybe some Genetic exactly. <laughs> that was hard for me to wrap my head around. Like we're, we're basically starting to move those around because the the there's a, some evidence of inbreeding depression. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Oh man. Well. Okay. So basically, it sounds like what you're recommending is that we do our darndest to to know the the origin of the seeds um, before planting them, and in most situations, you want them to be from a source that's that's as close as possible. Yeah, close as possible and ideally the same site. And maybe, you know, another one would be to try to avoid moving stuff between Bonnie Dune and the San Lorenzo uh, mm -hmm. Valley Sandhills. These are pretty um, far apart, right, um, mm -hmm. geographically. And probably, you know, unless we're moving stuff, there's probably not as much um, interchange going on, gene flow between those. So, yeah, I mean, if you can do that. If, and then also, you know, the other thing is people tend to plant, want to plant pines and things. And there's some areas that just don't have pines. And maybe there's a reason for that. And there can be downsides to planting things that, you know, don't necessarily belong there. There's a lot of complex, you know, interactions and species interactions that are be kept in mind. So anyway, I don't want to poo-poo yeah. but restoration and valuable things like that, but the check out the Sand Hills Conservation Management Plan. It has this chapter, I think it's like mm -hmm. 11 or something on, on restoration and okay, things, cool. to think, things to think about. Yeah. And I'll be sending out a follow-up email to everyone who registered with um, a couple of resources and I'll include that plan. Um, in the resources. I, about the, this, well, first off, how did you get thousands of seeds per plot of the Ben Lomond wallflower if they're so rare? And like, were they, right. were those all from the Bonnie Dune ecological? Were the yes, so all, all the Dune? seed we used was bulked from the seed collected in the extant wallflower population here. Wow. So that was a process. So um, we grew up seedlings um, with, in the greenhouse and then uh, the greenhouse was definitely, some of them just stayed in the greenhouse and we bulked them there. And then some of them we actually outplanted as juveniles into the habitat as like part of a pilot study to test our treatments. And those did amazing. And then we harvested the seed from those. So, oh. um, so yeah, we, we bulked it basically is the short okay. answer. And with the plots, they're like the little yellow little sticks and then there are the longer metal sticks. What do okay. those each <laughs> indicate? <laughs> Yeah, the little yellow toothpicks that are still there, those were marking individual focal plants that we monitored for survivorship. And then the longer sticks are the um, pin flags that are inverted that are marking the transplants. So seedlings from seed versus transplants from the greenhouse. Okay. All right. 
Um, so we had some other questions come in. Um, are there uh, exotic invaders? Are the exotic invaders more flammable? The so this is when you were talking about invasive plants that do well within the Santa Cruz sand hills. Yeah. Um, how do they do with fire? Yeah, I would say definitely. I was going to bring up the photo. I would say. The, certainly the, the exotic brooms, probably not the pampas grass. I don't think that's a big fire. I mean, it probably would burn, but I would say the, the French broom, the Portuguese broom, and the acacia, those are all adding fuel um, to the sand parkland, to the sand chaparral, and they're uh, highly flammable. Um, the, and even the herbaceous uh, stuff that is so ecologically damaging, um, you know, some of these dry grasses and stuff, they're not you know, that it creates fine fuel and fine fuel can help carry fire. So I guess I would say it's all flammable and, um, you know, the native sand hills plants are flammable too. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's no denying that. But, um, but yeah, I would say the invasives are sort of adding fuel to the landscape. I just remembered another like grass um, story that I recently heard about with the reserve and that's that bear grass mm -hmm. lives in the area. Isn't bear grass one of those plants that's a fire follower? Um, yeah, I believe it is promoted by fire. I have some pictures of it burning, and I believe it came back pretty well the few years after. I didn't really study it. It's up in the moon rocks, so I didn't kind of oh, take yeah. a close look at it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Marie is wondering, what is a good resource to get sand hills plants identified? Oh, well, I mean, you know, if it's not like a ton, I mean, there are all sorts of apps and stuff that help with that. I don't know if any of them actually work, though. Um, I mean, there's Calflora. <laughs> Calflora is a great uh, website if you have photos um, and you know can um, there's species lists for the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve or maybe some of the other sites the Sand Hills Conservation Management Plan I believe has a species list you're welcome to look me up online and send me some photos if it's not a ton I don't know um, yeah that's it, a great question I would say yeah. Calflora would be my go-to and then maybe some of the apps that maybe others can suggest that actually yeah. actually will help get you to something. iNaturalist, yeah, you can use iNaturalist or something and crowdsource your question. Yeah, and I know that we have a lot of California Native Plant Society um, members in the audience tonight, so maybe they want to chime in with some of their favorites. Um, but the museum is a really big fan of using iNaturalist, especially in the wake of the fires where we've partnered with California Native Plant Society on a community science project to help empower people to contribute to um, data post fire. And it's also just a great tool for helping you identify what you're seeing. Um, and it, you know, it takes some effort, it takes some getting used to, um, but the algorithm's not bad and it's also a social platform. So uh, people great. who have expertise can go in and help you. So I'd recommend that. Um, and uh, your the website that you put together on the Sand Hills also has uh, is a great resource for understanding at least some of these rare um, species that live in the Sand Hills. So I'll include that link as well. Great. Um, and then Kari's wondering, she wants to clarify what you were discussing with the, um, the genetic differences of these different populations. Um, so she's saying, so the different locations within the sand hills have the same species, but different genetic populations. Does she have that correct? Yes, that's exactly correct. And it's not, we don't know, obviously, the genetic <laughs> composition of all the populations, but from what we saw from wallflower, there's definitely differentiation and um, genetic diversity amongst populations. And so that's one species. And then you'll see morphological differences, like species with different um, flower colors, for example, amongst different sites. Um, all yellow flowers versus yellow and white flowers. Uh, we, we see a fair amount of that that can be driven by, by pollinators and selection. And, um, you know, it doesn't mean they're necessarily, um, you know, new species or anything, but that's probably, the, that's the process by which, you know, you do get genetic diversity and um, natural selection. So we do try to preserve some of that diversity among sites, yep. I wonder too, with fragmentation being more common now, like uh, more extreme, is it likely that there was more, you know, like cross-pollination? Uh, 
uh, you know, a hundred years ago with these different sites or? Yeah. I mean, there could have been, I mean, there's some, you know, the, at some point these always were islands, you know, not always, I mean, this is like speaking in our in recent times, right. When we have the map. So I'm uh, sorry, I'm trying to find my own map. Um, there's the, probably the best one, the, you know, um, so some, to some extent they've been fragmented. Um, and then to some extent it was always isolated in recent, you know, history. So, um, you know, before we started fragmenting it, certainly there was probably better opportunities to move through some patches, but there's um, probably for long periods of time, what I would hate to quantify it, um, some of these patches have been isolated. So, yeah, and this is this is a, a helpful tool to see like how how separated they really are that those it looks like the the populations around Scotts Valley, Henry Cowell, like that part of the valley are you know, they're fragmented, but they're pretty close. Whereas where the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve is like definitely separated yeah. by, a, by a, a substantial difference. Um, and we did have another question that came in from Angie and sometimes Nicola. <laughs> um, can you briefly explain the difference between a Monterey Cypress and a Santa Cruz Cypress? Boy, I mean, there's all sorts of uh, morphological differences. Like, is that what they're probably getting at? The um, the cone size, you know, Santa Cruz Cypress um, cones are typically smaller than Monterey Cypress. Um, the shape of the tree, um, you know, they're more erect um, versus Monterey Cypress tend to be more sprawling. I mean, I would have to sort of look up myself without, you know, going through all the morphological characters. They they don't they don't co-occur. I don't know if you're trying to differentiate them mm -hmm. where you are. Um, there's probably lots of good resources that can kind of help you dial that in. Yeah, and I just say that, um, so like they're different species, right? Like they're in the oh, same yeah. genus, but they're different species. But um, the Monterey Cypress has been heavily planted all along the coast. And so like, that's the one that you see on West Cliff Drive is the Monterey Cypress. Um, the Santa Cruz Cypress has also been planted in places you can see some at the UC Santa Cruz Arboretum and Botanic Garden. I know that too. Um, but around the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve, I don't, I don't know, Jody, do you know, are there Monterey cypresses that have been planted around the reserve? I don't think so. I can't place any. Yeah. I know that there are definitely some like on your drive up Bonnie Dune Road, you drive through some sure. Monterey cypress, but around the reserve, the only cypress that you're going to see, and it's got like kind of similar like leaves. <laughs> To the, to the Monterey Cypress, but sure. the, the Santa Cruz Cypress is the one that you'd see there. And we are gonna have a walk there this weekend. It's full, but um, for those of you who were able to sign up, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, go this weekend and we'll look closely at that tree. Um, and then we'll definitely have other walks in the reserve coming up. So make sure that you're signed up for our newsletter so that you can be among the first to get notified of walks when they do occur, because they do tend to fill up. Um, and then, one other question from Lucy, wondering if you knew anything about the disjunct Abrams cypress in Swanton. Yes, I've heard about the famed disjunct Abrams cypress in Swanton from um, Jim West's write-up. So I haven't seen it personally, but I've definitely read about it and don't know its origin. There's also one that's supposedly up in, or I think I've seen that one up in um, Lompico too. So I think there's kind of a few trees here and there, and I, I don't know, um, you know, if they're um, you know, precede anyone kind of moving them around. I think there's some indication that the one in Swanton is naturally occurring, but how it got there, and I don't know the, the details. Okay. Um, and just to clarify, when Lucy says Abram Cypress, that's the same as saying Santa Cruz Cypress? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay, good to know. <laughs> um, well, I know that we're, we're a little after seven now, so um, I think I'll just end with one last um question, which is what can community members do to support this habitat, to support the sand hills? Oh gosh, that's not an easy question. I mean, there's so much. If you have time and there's the different skill sets, there's always something you could do, you know. Um, if people want to get involved in like hands-on stuff, there's there's all sorts of, you know, broom removal work at Quail Hollow and restoration projects. Like we, we're going to be wanting to use that fuel break at Bonnie Dune for our study. If you want to come move all the slash that they put on it, <laughs> unfortunately, that's not going to help that fuel break. You know, we'll have some volunteer days uh, where we set those up. So those are sort of hands-on things. 
Um, you know, if you live in the sand hills, obviously being conscientious about uh, what you're planting and what you're doing, um, you know, keep the lights to a minimum so that the June beetles aren't attracted to your nocturnal nights. I mean, there's just, you know, go to the Sand Hills website, um, and if you don't find any answers and you want to email me, I can give you some more suggestions. But there's lots of sort of public education opportunities, restoration opportunities, you know, yeah, I would say there's a lot. Yeah, and um, in terms of uh, seeking volunteers for your work, how's the best way to stay informed about that? Yeah, I mean, if people want to email me, I'll, I'll start getting a list going, and then when it's time to to set up our plots, I'd be more than happy to have use that list and reach out to people and see if they're available. Okay, cool. So I'll include your email in our follow up um, email, and uh, for everyone that's joining, if you'd like to uh, be included on that email, you can follow up directly with Jody. I'll also share that there's a group called Friends of the Bonnie Jean Ecological Reserve that does like trail work. They basically like manage the trail system throughout the reserve. Um, and I can include their contact information as well. And uh, other public spaces that have sand hills, you mentioned Quail Hollow County Park and Henry Cowell State Park, um, both of which also accept volunteers. So I'm sure you all can reach out to them. And yep. thanks for reminding us all about um, keeping, keeping some night sky for the, for the June beetles. <laughs> yeah. And... I'm just, I'm, I'm really grateful for, for this presentation. Like I said, the Bonnie Jean Ecological Reserve is just one of my absolute favorite places. I've uh, loved exploring it for the past several years and look forward to continue to seeing how it's, how it changes. And I, I hope that um, all of you joining us tonight find some time to go out there and take a look for yourself. It's one of the, the few places that burned in the fires that is publicly accessible at this time. Um, so go give it a look. And I think with that, we will say good night and I'll be in touch with an email to everyone. And uh, Jody, when I kick everyone out, I'm gonna kick you out too. Okay, all right, cool. <laughs> Great, thanks so much. Thanks right. so much for all your work on behalf of the Sandhills and this, this whole series. It's been really great to participate. Yeah, awesome. Okay, um, see you all next time. Bye.